And our next guest knows isolation in space very well. He's a retired Colonel astronaut, Chris Hadfield. Colonel Hadfield, welcome. Pleased to be talking with you, Anthony. Well, what are the lessons that NASA and those behind a possible eventual mission uh, to Mars can learn from this incredibly elaborate simulation? Well, if you're going to go live in a new place, there's a bunch of different things to solve. And Mars is a pretty harsh place to live. Uh, and so part of the problem is technological. You know, how do you build the machines that can produce the air and keep everybody alive? How do you grow the food? Uh, how, what do you do if someone gets sick? You know, someone, whatever, has to have their appendix taken out. And then what do you do with the radiation and the weird environment? And how do you keep people psychologically healthy? And eventually, we're going to be having people live on Mars. And so at some point, you've got to start addressing all those problems. And uh, for, what was it, 378 days, people were inside a, a 3D printed habitat, testing all of those things all together. And those lessons learned kind of lay the, the foundation or the bedrock for how we're going to do it for real when we get there. All right, so for these individuals, uh, life as they knew it effectively, at least for the past 378 days, uh, no longer. They missed a lot, certainly, but they gained a lot of other things. Describe the challenges, uh, physically and certainly mentally, that would have taken and that they experienced. Well, they put them in a 3D printed habitat, much like uh, we may end up having on the surface of Mars. Inside it, it had all of the equipment they needed to stay healthy. They had... Uh, uh, you know, food preparation and food growing, they had exercise equipment, even though Mars is one third gravity. So you don't get all the weightlifting that you get on Earth just by being alive. Um, they had exercise equipment to keep their bodies healthy. They had communications. But of course, Mars is so far away that when you, you know, say hello into your phone, it, it could take many minutes to get to Mars and minutes back. So they lived with that isolation of the time lag with people. And they were running a whole suite of experiments and occasionally going outside into a simulated Martian habitat. So trying to make it as realistic as possible so that the crew actually starts to really believe that they are there. So then the conclusions that you draw, the problems that come up, they're much more credible. It's not just people pretending, but it becomes a, as good a simulation as you can build. And they'll be... Uh, you know, writing and cataloging all of their lessons learned for months now to make sure we squeeze every bit of information out of it that we can, building a bigger and bigger book of how it is that people are going to live on Mars. So in terms of that book, what's the next chapter? Well, the biggest, hardest chapter is the opening one, and that is, how do you get there? Uh, Mars is way further away than most people think. If you get in some of the fastest human spaceships we've ever built, the moon takes about three days. Mars takes six months. Wow. And imagine, Anthony, if you and I got into a primitive, tiny little ship, uh, you know, like a four-seat car, and we now had to spend six months traveling through uh, a hostile and not largely well-known environment just to get to our destination, that is a real obstacle. And the, the big limitation is just how good is our rocket engine technology. And right now, it's it's not you know, jets, or it's not even propeller airplanes, or it's not even steamships. We're somewhere back in the rowboat phase of spaceships, if we're going to cover that length of distance. So, I, you know, I think the first chapter of getting to Mars, there's lots of people working on it, all types of different engines. I think we're going to need uh, a, a new type of engine to cut the time short enough that then it becomes safer and therefore less expensive something we can fit into the rest of society as we start to settle somewhere between the Earth, mm -hmm. space station, moon, and now Mars. No, technologically, I was a huge mountain to climb. But with what just happened over the past 378 days, they're one step closer. I mean, we used to think this is just science fiction. But as an aside, does this give you a little more confidence that a mission to Mars is actually possible, even likely? I've always thought it was both possible and likely since I was a little kid. The only thing that's keeping us from doing it is how much effort we want to put into it. You know, we, we already have all the technology we need to do it. It's just right now it would be very dangerous. So we need a real driving purpose to go. And right now it's just scientific curiosity and, and natural human need to explore like we've been doing since we were infants. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to happen. 
Uh, we just we sort of forget that that's how everything in history happens. Someone said, well, we could never do that. And someone else said, well, I'm willing to give it a try. And suddenly you've, you know, sailed the seven seas and and been to the South Pole and lived on a space station. And, you know, so all those things have happened. Mars is the next step. But we want to do it as informed and safely as we can. And that's what these four crew members did in their little 1,700 square foot, four bedroom habitat for uh, for over a year. And it's what the crew's doing up on the space station too, Anthony. Uh, one of the crew members who's up there right now, he's been in space, I checked, 1,033 days in his life over five space flights. And the longest anybody's been on a space flight in one go was 437 days without a break. So one of the things we're testing just living on the space station is human psychology, human physiology, human endurance, and all of those things put together. That's how we go further and, and push the edges of, of the unknown for everyone. Well, speaking of the space station, you spent many days there, and uh, I want to shift to the more urgent situation right now, and that is of the Boeing Starliner spacecraft docked at the International Space Station. So what we know is that it's experiencing major technical issues. Uh, some people have characterized it as the, the astronauts being stranded. Uh, that has been disputed, obviously, but given everything, what, if any, danger are these astronauts in? Well, yeah, choosing the word stranded is fun, makes a nice headline. It's not true. You know, it's like everybody's stranded. You know, we're all stranded here on Earth. You're mm -hmm. stranded in your hometown, if, you, if that's the way you want to look at it. Um, I lived on the space station for six months. I thought it was the most um, uh, in, inspiring and stimulus-rich place I'd ever lived in my whole life. Or I could have said, hey, I'm stranded up here. Um, the crew that's up there, the, the mix of the crew that's been living there, and then the Starliner crew that came up, Butch and Sonny, they're doing a huge amount of work. Um, they were working, I, they took July the 4th off because they're Americans, of course, but um, they've done all sorts of experiments. They're, they're just part of the regular space station crew. And it's a test flight of their vehicle. I mean, it's designed to be able to stay up for seven months, and it's been up there for a month. You said at the outset of that question that it's had some serious major problems. In fact, that, that's an over-exaggeration. It's got a bunch of helium tanks and they've got some tiny helium leaks, but they're okay. well within what it can stand. And it had one thruster failed out of dozens. And then a couple others, or I guess four others that clicked off, but then they got them working again. So this is a test flight, the great chance to understand how this spaceship works for real. But they went in and did a bunch of tests uh, just after Canada Day and ran all the systems and the vehicle came back with, with good health. And now it's just a matter of when's a good scheduled time because they still have never properly tested the re-entry, the huge parachute that has to open, and then the airbags that cushion the landing. That's all still for Butch and Sonny to test. So by no means is this test flight over. But I, I'm not too worried about two more astronauts being on the space station. That, that's what astronauts do for a living. Okay, though well, that's important to clarify. So in terms of uh, how long they could be there, some are saying that it would be effectively indefinitely. Is that fair to say? And what is required to get them home? Well, uh, scheduling more than anything. I um, mean, right now, you know, the orbit sort of pivots slowly around the world. And sometimes you're in the sunlight all the time and things get hot and, and uh, it depends how you want the angle to the sun to be. It's got to integrate with the space walking schedule, other vehicles coming and going. You know, it's, all, it's, it's a huge scheduling nightmare to undock and, and leave a space station just because it, it interrupts everything else. And the crew's not in any danger. The, their vehicle is checking out uh, pretty close to perfect health. Got a few things, but all spaceships do. And they'll come home whenever it makes sense. They're really taking advantage uh, of a great opportunity to truly wring everything out of this test flight so that the next time it flies with Canadian Josh Kutrick on board, it'll be a proven safer vehicle for him to fly. Okay. Uh, given all that, I mean, you don't even want to think uh, from an alarmist point of view, but if it were to ever to be required here or in general, is NASA equipped or perhaps prepared for a rescue mission if it came to that? Well, there are multiple vehicles like uh, spaceships docked to the space station. And let's say they had a fire this afternoon, you know, or, or, a, or a meteorite crashing in the side, punched a hole. We always are ready for an immediate 
evacuation of the space station. You jump into your spaceship, you close the hatch, and you analyze whether it's time to come home right away or maybe hang on for a while and deal with the problem. And right now, all the spaceships that are docked are healthy and able to bring people, bring people home. But you, what if a meteorite punched into the, the Soyuz or into the Dragon? Then that vehicle would become unserviceable. And then you know, everybody could pile into the Dragon and come home. Everybody could pile into the, uh, the Starliner and come home. It's not what you want to do. But yeah, we, it's a lot safer now than it used to be when we just had the shuttle and the Soyuz, or for several years, where we just had the Soyuz. We've got multiple layers of, of safety now. So uh, if you weren't worried about it then, you sure don't need to be worried about it now. Either way, it's an opportunity to learn no matter what, even in the worst case scenario, it's a, it's a test for eventual missions, uh, no matter how it happens. Um, we appreciate all of your time, sir, and your insight. Uh, that is Colonel Astronaut Retired Chris Hadfield, and uh, I should mention as well, author of many books, and the latest book is called The Defector, uh, an incredible spy thriller uh, that takes place in space as well. Uh, Colonel Hatfield, we appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Great to talk with you, Anthony, and, uh, and I look forward to the next time. I look forward to the crew of Starliner safely back on Earth.